What is going on, everybody? It's Dave Fonts, and we're here for our AEW on TNT review holiday bash edition part number one. As part two will be this coming Saturday, three days from now on Christmas night. But tonight we had ourselves Darby Allen, Sting, and CM Punk versus MJFTR. In a six-man tag match for the main event, as well as Ruby Soho taking on Nyla Rose in the first of two semifinal matches. The other semifinal match for the TBS tournament will be next week. Plus, we had Adam Cole versus Orange Cassidy with a debut on hand that everybody saw coming, and it was fucking fantastic. Plus, we find out when the, the aftermath of what happened with the terribly booked 60-minute Notice uh, the 60 minute world title match from last week and when that rematch is happening and it just makes me wonder why is it happening when it's happening now We started the show off. It was Adam Cole versus Orange Cassidy However way to start off this mat this show For whatever reason Orange Cassidy has gotten to the cross has walked into the crosshairs of one Adam Cole baby and Adam Cole has had a problem with Orange Cassidy, the best friends, and everything in between for I don't know how long. But they come out here. They have themselves a match. Now, the biggest thing going into this match is what was Adam Cole's surprise and present to the Young Bucks? We all knew who it was going to be. But when is he going to make his debut? When is he going to show up? What is going to go down tonight? So they're having their match, and of course, Orange Cassidy, they, they start the match off, and both men are across, across the ring from each other. Adam Cole comes up to him, draws a line in the sand. Orange Cassidy walks around that, draws a line in the sand. They go back and forth this for a bit. Adam Cole does his Adam Cole, baby, and, and, and Orange Cassidy grabs his hands and puts them in Orange's pockets. <laughs> like, what in the blue hell was that? So they have a good, good match. Just went back and forth as, of, as you knew it was going to. Now the Young Bucks come out, Brandon Cutler come out. They send Brandon Cutler out. Orange Cassidy actually, he was going for a dive. He was gonna go up top and take out, uh, go to dive on Adam Cole. Ends up diving on Brandon Cutler, taking him out. Trent, the best friends come out and take out the Young Bucks and send them packing to the back. So it's down to one-on-one -on -one again. Adam Cole, um, Orange Cassidy actually gets a break in the action. Adam Cole is down. Here comes Bobby Fish. Bobby Fish comes down. He distracts while Orange Cassidy's in the middle of the ring. Crown, the one thing that sucks about crowds when it comes to people making no debuts is that the crowd gives it away. Oh, the person's coming down, so everyone's looking this way. Oh, if they're coming from the left, oh, they're looking to the left. But... Out of nowhere, from behind, where Kyle Riley comes in, hits, Kyle, like, hits a knee to Orange Cassidy, then the axe and smash combination gets out of the ring, allowing Adam Cole to hit the boom. One, two, three. Adam Cole is your winner, and Kyle Riley has joined AEW. We all knew it was going to happen. And was wondering when it was going to happen until Adam Cole teased it last week that this was when we were going to see Kyle Riley. Now, Kyle Riley is beating up on Orange. Cole pulls him off. They have words because if you remember, the last thing Adam Cole did in NXT before jumping ship was put over Kyle Riley in a blood feud in NXT. Now, they start, uh, the best friends come down again to try and help. Um, Orange Cassidy, Kyle Riley, and Adam Cole starts fighting them, and Bobby Fish comes in to help too. We get a huge undisputed chant, which honestly they can't be called the undisputed era. But how about the undisputed elite? They could get into a feud with the elite when Kenny Omega comes back, and we could have the undisputed elite versus the elite. And that would get away around doing the Undisputed Era. They could still do... They probably can't do the Undisputed thing anymore with the... Um, oh, hand gesture. that to come with something else. But that's neither here nor there. But the Bucks come down. They're like, really? This is your surprise? Really? What the fuck, dude? What the hell is this guy doing here? Like, what the hell? They come down. They literally get in the ring. They talk. They say stuff to Adam Cole. Adam Cole, who's standing with... And it was really awesome. 
Because if you go back to when they first made their debut at TakeOver Brooklyn 2. I think it was 2 or 3. Brooklyn 3, I think it actually was. And they stand in the middle of the ring, and you have all three guys there. It was the same vibe you got here. Kyle O'Reilly just got that look of disgust and evil in his eyes. Kyle, it, it, this honestly felt like back when they made their debut, and they st they were the OG Undisputed Era before Roderick Strong joined them. This is what this felt like again, and it was fucking awesome. So they're standing there. Looks like it. It was about. It looked about the time they about ready. You know, put up the old Undisputed Era um, hand gesture, which again they can't use because that's owned by WWE. When the Young Bucks come in and cat Adam Cole turns to them and says some things we can't hear what they're saying so he walks forward and him and um red dragon as they were known follow suits and they leave without the young bucks so very very interesting to see what's going to happen with these guys right here because the bucks seem to be fine with bobby fish but they do not seem to be fine with kyle o'reilly now, I don't know the history of Kyle O'Reilly and the Young Bucks in Ring of Honor. I never really got to watch Ring of Honor. I mean, I didn't know Sinclair. We had a, I had a Sinclair affiliate for anything until about six months after all of them left. So I didn't get to really check much of the stuff. The only thing outside of NXT I saw Kyle O'Reilly do was everything with What Culture Pro Wrestling. That was it. When they did the tournament, when they did the World Cup tournament, I think he had a match or two on their loaded, the loaded, um, TV show, um, YouTube show. So that's about all I knew of Kyle O'Reilly before NXT. So everything. So yeah, I don't know their history. I don't know if he feuded with them very much, but yeah, big thing coming up for AE for AEW coming up very soon, man. And I can't wait to see what happens, where this goes. The Bucks don't seem to be on board with Kyle O'Reilly as much as they were with Bobby Fish. Well, I was thinking that, you know, Kyle O'Reilly comes in, they do the whole thing they had here. The Bucks come out, you know, they question and be like, and Adam Cole could be like, you know, guys, that wasn't even the surprise, the, the big surprise. And then, of course, Red Dragon and, Kyle and Adam Cole beat the hell out of the Young Bucks and stand tall. Maybe that still happens down the road where we get those guys beating up um, the Young Bucks. And the Young Bucks go on their merry way. They turn babyface again while the Undisputed Elite, as we should call them until otherwise known, actually takes over as the big time heels in AEW. So much funny is then in the ring, we see what happened with um, Brian Danielson and Hangman Page last week. And the rematch, Danielson, Hangman 2, will be happening on January 5th. Why? I know it's the very first episode on TBS, and you want to make that the biggest, pay biggest show ever. But you have Battle of the Belts three days later. The only match we have right now for Battle of the Belts is... The women's championship match. And they did tease on Friday last week. The tag team titles will probably be defended too. With the Jurassic Express getting that title shot. But wouldn't you want to have this be the main event of your first ever Battle of the Belts? The main event of the first episode on January 5th on TBS. Should be the winner. The TBS women. The TBS title. That should be your main event. Especially if it will end up being Ruby Soho versus Thunder Rosa. If that is your main event, if that is your finals for that belt, that should be your main event. No if ands, or buts about it. But for some reason, they decided we're going to have this be on the first TBS show. Which, if Battle of the Belts was not three days later, I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. It is the first, it's the first show on TBS, you want it to be the biggest show you could have. But it just doesn't make any sense to me that you don't have that be on Battle of the Belts. Because that's going to be... You want your first Battle of the Belts to be as big as it can be. And right now, the Women's Championship match against with Riho and the Faker just isn't big enough. The tag team titles, if that's what it's going to be too, isn't big enough. 
Brian Danielson, Hangman Adam Page 2 would have been the best match for Battle of the Belts. Why you're putting it on January 5th makes zero sense to me. So Tony Schiavone brings out the world champion who talks about like after the bell rang and everything was over. Uh, he never felt, last week he said he never felt less of a champion. The only thing Page felt was disappointed. Out came Brian Danielson who said the only person who should feel disappointed is me. The person who kicked your ass for 60 minutes and the only reason you're still champion is because the bell rang. And I'm thinking, yeah, you kicked his ass for 45 minutes and then Adam Hangman Page kicked your ass for 10 minutes and then you guys stalled for 5 minutes just to get through to 60 minutes. So, yeah, no, that, that doesn't hold weight at all. So basically this all leads to what Brian Danielson proposes. We do another 60 minute match, but if it goes the time limit, we have judges. What? This is the best you could come up with for your for your rematch is judges. Oh my god, that is so stupid. This isn't the 1960s, this isn't the 1980s, this isn't even um, classic British wrestling. You don't need judges. A no time limit or hell, a cage match would have been fine. An Iron Man match, something would have been better than judges. So, they're going 60 minutes again, aren't they? We're going to get 60 minutes again for judges to tell us who is the champion. Is that how we're going to book this? Because why would you put judges on a pap on a match if you're not going to use them? What is the fucking point? So we're going to get another 60-minute match that goes to judges. This is bad booking. They are making Hangman Adam Page, his title reign, his title reign has, is starting out very, very badly. It was a nice title reign for the first few weeks until he got his first match and it went 60 minutes with no fucking winner. And now we're going to go to judges? Bad, bad booking all around. I love the fact that Hangman on the page did come out and say that he was thinking maybe we have an Inferno match. Yeah, I don't see that happening unless it was on pay-per-view. I, I just don't get why this is the this is the best you could come up with is judges. Anybody who says they love this idea, you're a fucking moron. This is the best. I know Tony Khan is a wrestling fan. He loves classic wrestling, but this is something that needs to stay in the past. This isn't boxing. This isn't MMA. I don't want to see a wrestling match go 60 fucking minutes and go, oh, well, two people thought Pangman won, did it? And another one thought Brian Danielson was the should have won the championship. No, let's not fucking do that. Or it'll be another thing where we have judges who go to a, um, to a tie. It's a draw again, just so we can get the fucking revolution for a third match. This is a disaster already. Why put the title on the guy if you're not going to give him a legitimate win over somebody like Brian Danielson? Judge, if it goes 60 minutes and it goes to judges, that's another terrible fucking way for Hangman Adam Page to retain the championship. This is, uh, like, I thought, oh, well, getting him a match against Danielson is going to be great. It'll be a way to be able to legitimize his championship reign. Nope, 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 nope. We're just going to make him one of the most Ill illegitimate champions out there because we're going to go to judges, and he's going to win because the judges are rigged. Are you fucking kidding me? Bad booking overall. You booked Kenny Omega as perfectly as a heel champion as you could, and you're making Kangman Adam Page into one of the worst champions you have ever had just for this terrible fucking booking over and over and over again. Just typical AEW. Like, I don't know what Tony's thinking, but this is terrible. Absolutely terrible. Moving on here. Pinnacle is shown backstage MJF runs down Warlord for not protecting him last week because he does pay him a lot of money in kayfabe. So MJF isn't happy at the fact that Warlow pretty much just left him out to dry last week while they were getting beat up. 
But he blames CM Punk because this is what Punk does. And in face and everything that like the, the nice guy Punk, that the face that that face that he's wearing, that nice guy guy Punk face, it's falling off faster than and wearing off faster than stakes things face paint. But like they are a family and Punk and them and them can't say that. So he says there's no problem. They have no problem with Punk, but if any of them want to be kings, they have to kill one as they talk about to themselves. So CM Punk and them will be your main event, and we'll talk about that later. Wardlow takes on Captain Sean Dean, basically just giving more reason for people to want to love Wardlow. Comes out, hits a hits like within thirty seconds, hits a power bomb, picks him up. Crowd is losing, like yeah, yeah, another one, one more time. Hits another one. Sean Spears is out there, like trying to tell him to stop. He hits a third one. Crowd is into it. Hits a fourth one. Put on Sean Dean, one, two, three, and that is that. So, how long is it going to be until Wardlow just beats the living shit out of Sean Spears? Sean Spears is out there. He's the accountability buddy. But we all know, eventually, Sean Spears is going to be the guy who pushes Wardlow way too far and then just gets absolutely destroyed by Wardlow. And Wardlow just... That's going to be the start of Wardlow's turn to a babyface. I mean, when a, when a crowd says one more time and you give them one more and they do it again and again, that's more babyface tendencies and that's more... And you can see when Spears comes in and hits the hits Sean Dean with the chair twice, Wardlow's not really happy about that. He didn't ask for Sean Spears to do that. He doesn't want Sean Spears to do that. So, yeah, it's going to happen soon. What does that mean for MJF and Wardlow's partnership? I don't know. Dan Lambert talks from trash. Really didn't give a shit. Then we had the faker shit. Don't give a crap. Moving on. And then we go to a video package of Owen Hart that features footage from him wrestling in Japan while a variety of wrestlers such as Mark Henry, Matt Hardy, Adam Cole, and 2.0. Not Christian, which is surprising. It was a beautiful video package. I'm really cool that they did that. No information on who, who, how the tournament's going to be, if it's going to be a, round, a single elimination tournament, round robin, like a G1. None of that. I thought we were supposed to get that information, but apparently they're not ready to tell us. And then you go online, and you go see how stupid the fucking community is, and you see people who are upset that WWE, like, there was some dumbass who was like, we didn't hear anything from Brett, Natty, or any of the Hart family, so this is just a way to spite WWE. Well, first off, dumbasses, Natalia still works for the WWE. So she wasn't going to be able to say anything anyway. Maybe they couldn't get the Hart family. Maybe Brett didn't have time. Who fucking knows? AEW got this because Martha wants to honor her husband. Martha is not going to let the company that caused his death to be anywhere near it. So if you still have it hung up, this is an AEW versus WWE thing. God forbid anybody but WWE is allowed to honor Owen Hart, who was a guy that without Owen Hart, the wrestling business would not be the wrestling business we see today. And you guys, you got guys like a Mark Henry who worked closely with Owen Hart, a Christian who was there, Matt Hardy, and others who were influenced by Owen Hart. But God forbid anybody else but WWE touches that fucking subject. Fuck you if you think that way. Go sit in your mother's basement and shut the fuck up and let AEW do the right thing and honor this man. Because at least somebody's allowed to honor him. I get sick and fucking tired of seeing dumb fuck retards on, to, on, a, on social media bitching and moaning and whining and complaining that oh, and, and anybody other than WWE actually gets to do something with the Owen Hart name, can actually honor this man because his wife does not like WWE, not out of spite. Would you be happy if your loved one was killed by a, by a company who wants to go ahead and then earn, and just exploit his name over and over and over again? Would you be happy with that? Would you allow that? No, you would not. Owen Hart 
is being honored in two tournaments. I don't know what's going to be there. I don't know who's going to be in them. Martha will be on hand to give the trophies to the men and the women who the men, the man and the woman who wins. If you don't like it, shut the fuck up and move on with your life. It's not that fucking hard. Moving on here. Ruby Soho versus Nala Rose. This is the semifinal first semifinals match in the TBS tournament. Ruby Soho, of course, is the first, the last person in this tournament who did not get a bye. And honestly, I think Ruby Soho is going to be the one to win the tournament. Which again, if Jay Cargill does not win the next match, which she honestly should fucking not, she should be nowhere near the women's any women's title or any title period near and not right now. But if it is Ruby Soho versus um, Thunder Rosa in the finals, that could have been your main event on TBS on the first night on TBS on January 5th. That could have been your main event, but instead they want to give it Adam Page versus Brian Danielson instead of that being a battle of the belts. So I don't know when this finals is going to be. I still think it's going to be on January 5th unless they're going to make the finals at the Battle of the Belts, which I don't fucking know. By the way, Battle of the Belts is only going to be a one-hour show. I don't know why you can't make it two, but not all titles are going to be on the line, so I don't know what's going to happen there. So we had this match, Ruby Soho versus Nala Rose. Of course, Nala Rose. Not like, like any of the four women they say could be a favorite to be the first ever TBS Women's Champion. I mean, Nala Rose, they said the second ever Women's Champion. Thunder Rosa, damn, uh, uh, is a badass. Ruby Soho, definitely somebody who was underutilized in WWE coming over here and could be a hell of a first champion. Then you got Jay Cargill, who's given too much too soon, in my opinion. So, this match was fine. I mean, it just didn't feel like they... It didn't have the intensity you think you should have. Both of these women did not feel like they were fighting to get to the next round in the tournament. They're, like, if you watch Serena Deeb and Sheeta from last week, and the fire Sheeta, like, they had in them when they were fighting for basically pride and nothing else, you really didn't get that here. Of course, um, and the fact that Ruby Soho got a dragon sleeper on neither Rose was interesting. That was pretty good. Of course, Nala Rose looks like she's about ready to tap, but she's actually waving Vicky Guerrero to get up so she can get the help. So Nala actually was able to get a power bomb onto Ruby Soho, and she just power bombed her. She didn't power like beast bomb her like she usually would set out power bomb. She just power bombed her, but that didn't like that didn't work. She got a two count, so she drug Ruby Soho over to the road the corner. And I don't know what she was going for, but Ruby was able to get up, do a, what does she call it, the um, no future kick, which used to be the, the right kick, but the no future kick off the top rope, and she gets the pin, one, two, three, and Ruby Soho is your winner. Next week, of course, we'll see Jay Cargill hopefully lose to Thunder Rosa, and that would be the right call, plain and simple. If Jay Cargill even touches that women's championship and gets to hold that women's championship, it is absolutely worthless. Serena Deeb is showing that this is far for done between her and Sheeta. She is upset that Sheeta used the ropes, the top, the turnbuckle, exposed turnbuckle, to win her match last week. She calls it a tainted victory. And she says, the next time we do this, I'm going to make sure that you want Tony Khan to make sure I ne you, like we never wrestle again. So, yeah, I, I kind of figured with the way they did that, that it's the trilogy, and of course, she'd have won the trilogy. She, they're not going to be done with this by a long shot. Malachi Black versus Griff Garrison. Of course, this match is happening because two weeks ago, Malachi showed up and misted um, Julia Hurt in the face, and we haven't seen Julia since. Who knows what's going on with that, if it's going to mean anything. I was wondering, could we see another debut in Brody King? Unfortunately, that did not happen. Now, Malachi Black dominated this guy for the most part. Griff Garrison did get a little bit of offense in because Malachi got distracted by um, Brian Pillman. He went outside. They squared up with each other, but that allowed Griff Garrison to hit a dive to the outside. Garrison looks to exchange some strikes with Black, which he loses out on as Black then brings him down to the heel hook. 
Black lights up get Griff with a lot of quick strikes and kicks in the corner. However, Griff keeps fighting and connects with the rolling elbow. But Black kicks out of a pinfall and then responds with a big knee strike. He looks to set up for the um, blackout, black mask. I don't know what they fucking call it right now. But he's like, fuck this. Goes on there, grabs a heel, an ankle pick, and gets him into a gable grip, which is a, gri a, a tighter grip on a single leg crab to... Um, get the tap out. He didn't tap out. He, he verbally submitted for the win. Pillman gets in the ring, tries to help, but gets dropped with the black mass. And that is that. Nothing here from there. So, don't know if this goes any further or what's going on, but that was how this went. So, and Rampage on Saturday, it's going to be Isaiah Cassidy versus Jungle Boy. And Matt Hardy's like, well, you know what's going to happen on Saturday if Jungle Boy gets... Isaiah Cassidy's going to pound that ass. Do we need to use that kind of language on TV? No, we do not. But they say if that happens, then they're going to become the number one contenders. I know that uh, Mark Quinn is out injured, even though he was in this backstage segment. So I doubt that's going to happen. He then um, Jungle Boy then responds saying he will bring me a lump of coal and shove it up Kenny, um, Kenny's ass. Um, Cassidy, um, seriously, who likes this show? Isaiah Cassidy's ass. And that they're going to beat them up. And he's going to make sure that they are still the number one contenders. And then Christian shows off this custom limited edition holiday t-shirt which has him in a chair. And the Jurassic Express behind them both have a sh um, short hand on his shoulders. I don't know. I know that's based off something. I just don't know what the hell it's based off of. It's um, some played on something. And then we get to the main event. This was majority of the second half hour. MJ, FTR versus CM Punk, Sting, and Darby Allin. Now, Sting comes out, working all fine and everything, but he has, C he has face paint with CM Punk's fist on his head. And the little red, the red lightning underneath, under his eyes. He's wearing a CM Punk shirt. Okay, he comes to the ring. Darby Allen then comes out. And he has a... He has purple face paint on in the style of Sting. Half face, of course. And then CM Punk comes out. And CM Punk is dressed as a surfer Sting. With black tights, a scorpion, but the but the scorpion has is the, has the Chicago flag in it. Instead of doing it's clobbering time, clobbering time, he does a stinger yell and at the ring at at the um stage. He had this crazy looking stinger surface sting paint on. <laughs> Pretty fucking cool. So it looks like we're gonna get CM Punk and MJF to start the match. MJF's like, nope, tags out. The whole thing about this match is C MJF keeps trying to get keeps getting away from CM Punk because you know CM Punk wants to get his hands on MJF and just beat the living shit out of this guy, but he's not getting ahead a hold of him. So that was a majority of this match. So the guys beat the hell out of CM. Um, they, like Darby Allen eventually gets in. It's all going crazy. Sting, my God, Sting. Every time you see Sting in the ring, you look back at his WWE career and go, wow. They got they would have had, if they would have played their cards right, they could have had the last good years of Sting in their ring. Maybe not winning championships, but putting a guy like a Seth Rollins over and a Roman Reigns over and others over, but they did not want to utilize him. And then you see Sting in this in matches like this, and he just looks like he's keep I don't know what it is, but he looks like he just keeps getting younger. He's like, I don't know if he's talking to Billy Gunn and getting um, advice from Billy Gunn on how to, you know, feel younger and look younger and wrestle younger. But the dude just, I don't know what it is, but this dude just every time. And wrestling in tag team matches is the best thing for Sting because it hides his weaknesses and he can go out there and give you a damn good match. Gee, wow, what a concept. Hiding, hiding a wrestler's weaknesses. That's, that's. That would never work. WWE does like WWE has it the right way, you know. Hide the hide their strengths and expose their weaknesses. That 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 gets somebody over. Not you know hide their weaknesses and 
like show off their strengths. That that never gets anybody over ever. FTR looked pretty good here, and the end of the match came when, well, there was a scary spot where De where Sting had MJF, and he grabs him and throws him over the ropes, over the over the ring. At least I swear, at least two feet up over the ropes, out to the way on, um, on into the waiting shoulders of FTR, but. Sting it literally looked like he hit, he slid off of FTR and smacked his head on the mat, on the ground. That was definitely some scary shit right there. I'm sure he was fine. I'm sure he didn't really hurt himself. But Sting decided he was going to do a s nice little... Um, he heads to the top, Tom Gold hits a crossbody to all three men. He throws MJF in the ring... And Punk is going to his tags and he's looking for the GTS on MT, MJF. However, Dax Harwood pushes him out of the way to take the square the stray bullet. He eats a GTS, a Scorpion Death Drop, and then Darby Allen, three fourths away, hits a coffin drop, barely getting it, but hitting him like getting his head to hit the stomach area of Dax Har of Dax Harwood. One, two, three, and the baby faces pick up the win. And what was one hell of a main event? And the show goes off the air with these guys celebrating. MJF up on commentary talking shit, getting pissed off. That CM, like, and I noticed also in this match, CM Punk did not get his hands on MJF. And if he did, it was very rarely. But I don't think he did, which is fucking smart. Those two should not fight or touch until the match is made. And until they get to their match. So AW playing this shit very very smart. Does it hurt? Like I like usually I would complain about tag team champions a champion getting beat, but they're the Triple A tag team champions, not the AEW tag team champions. And if I was correct, this was an AEW show, not a Triple A show. So it's not as big of a deal if it would have been um, FTR being the world tag team champions and then losing losing in a six man tag match this way. So it's not as a big of a deal as if it would have been the other way around. So there's that. Overall, good show. Better than last week, I will say. Last week, even even if the match had a like, even if the world that world title match would have had a satisfying conclusion, the show really felt like until we got to the main event, it kind of fell off. So this week felt pretty good. Main event was good. The first match was good. Kyle O'Reilly making his debut was good. I can't wait to see what goes that way. How far that goes. Seeing the Owen Hart video package that was awesome. Now, I didn't like I know some I'm sure of some people who grew up watching Owen Hart when he was in WWF and on up to his death probably had tears that are like was like getting a little watery and everything, seeing these guys talk about Owen, seeing some old footage. I didn't feel that way because I didn't know I I didn't know anything about Owen Hart until the day after he died. I didn't know a lick of Owen Hart. I was a WCW guy because I didn't have control of the controller when I was a um, kid. But the first time I even heard about Owen Hart was the day after because everybody in my school was talking about was talking about it. So that's the only way I knew about Owen Hart. But I went back and I saw everything he did on the WWE Network. When the network launched, I watched everything. I watched every single episode of Monday Night Raw from 1993 to 2003. The end of 2003 when I... Right before I started getting cable and I was able to start watching the WWE, I watched everything that I missed. So I eventually got to see what happened with Owen Hart from 1993 up until 1999. And it was just some great stuff. Everything he made, everything he was in, work. He was one of those guys that you're not going to see another guy. Like, whenever you hear, you're not going to see another Undertaker, Kurt Angle, Rock, The Rock, Stone Cold, and all that. You're never going to see another guy like Owen Hart. He honestly was, if Owen Hart would have come along today, he would be, he would be an upper echelon guy, probably fighting for world titles and everything. But unfortunately, he never got to be that way. I can't wait to see what these tournaments do. I wonder, I'm still, it's like, they say, you said, and it's, unless I missed something and I didn't, unless I really missed something. They said that they were going to get on last week on Rampage. They were going to give us more information on the Owen Hart tournament, but we didn't get any any more news other than what we what we already knew. So I don't know. So definitely a good episode of TV. I still scratch my head like you have Battle of the Belts, 
three days after your debut on TBS, which one, I don't know why it's three days after their debut. I figured it'd be at the end of January, which would make a little bit more sense, as, you know, we have all of February to get ready for Revolution. But for whatever reason, they're starting it, they're going with the first quarterly one on January 8th. Still doesn't make any sense, but Danielson and Hangman 2 feel like it should be safe for three days later. Have the contract signing. Have a contract signing on January 5th for that match, and then you have the match three days later. It just, it makes me wonder why. I just don't understand. But that is your AEW on TNT review. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Minds of the France Club, find me on twitch.tv slash the France Club, and find me on Instagram at the France Club, and I'll see you guys Monday, for, uh, maybe Saturday, maybe Saturday, but Monday for Raw, the final Raw of 2021, and then the final, and then Saturday, Wednesday for the final episode of TNT when this logo right here, the on TNT, will be replaced with an on TBS the week after. But until then, my name is France, and I'll see you guys later.